screen is sharing what it's supposed to. Cool, uh, I will accept silence as a yes. So hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, like I said. And today I will be going over what the essentials are to build a data product and more specifically what it takes to go from building a data notebook with all sorts of models in it to actually building a data app. So first of all, a few words about me before I dive into it. Uh, before I transitioned to a data science data architect type of role, I worked for three years as a data analyst here in Sofia. By education, I am a mathematician. I graduated from the American University in Blagojevgrad. Um, while I was an analyst, I realized that I love data. <laughs> uh, I decided to uh, dive a bit deeper into the tech side of things. So I applied for a master's in the US. I ended up doing my master's of science in analytics at Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, during my time there, I learned a ton of things, most of which the things I'm gonna be sharing today, I actually did learn from my master's program. Uh, during my time, at my master's, I also interned at LinkedIn in San Francisco, which was an awesome experience. I also learned a ton of things there. And for the past six months, uh, I have been working here with Questers for News UK as a data architect for the data team there. And yeah, I am also the proud father of a six month old baby. So if you hear crying from time to time from the other room, sorry about that. He's not been sleeping too well today. So yeah, there might be a bit of a slight interruption from time to time, but hopefully it's not too much. Uh, before I dive into the matter of things, uh, let's go over who this tech talk is best suited for. Like you saw, I am not that experienced. Uh, I only have about one year of experience as an actual data scientist. So my tech skills are not that well honed. But uh, like I said, before I started working as a data scientist, I had almost zero coding experience. I did a bit of Python things uh, while, while I was an analyst at GemSeq, but I couldn't really define myself as a, as a coder. Uh, most data scientists I knew and still know at the time were like me. Well, not like me, but uh, they had some coding experience, but most of what they did was running models and some of them really complicated models, but they would run them in Jupyter Notebooks or in our Markdown files. They would produce these awesome results but they were one-off things. Uh, not to say that that's a bad thing, but when trying to build a data product or a data app, there are a suite of different skills and stack, which are pretty basic. I would say that anyone who likes to code can very easily learn them, but are things which not many people know like as a whole, as a whole package. So I thought that that would be an interesting topic for a tech talk. Uh, so this is more suited for people with not too much program experience, if you do, sorry, most of these things won't be too new for you. Uh, people who are already data scientists, so they already know the cool stuff about models. I won't be going over those. I assume people already know those. And yeah, this is just basically building up from being a good data scientist to being a great, well honed one. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to be going over some basic tech stack. You need to productionize a data model. Uh, while I'm talking about that tech stock, I'll be going over some examples and use cases. And at the end, I'm going to just go over what I think makes a good data scientist. Well, scratch that, what makes a great data scientist. So like I said, a good model can only get you so far. Uh, for a model to be useful, there are two things which I think are major requirements which you need to do. First of all, you need a well-defined problem. Uh, just running a model on anything, yeah, you can do that, but in many cases, it's not really gonna to be too useful. Uh, if you don't have a well-defined business question or something you're trying to answer with your model, it's just gonna end up not being that well used. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, is what I'm trying to do, can this actually be uh, solved using data science? And why are we trying to model what we're modeling? Once you have that, you can already pick out, okay, this is a clustering problem, this is a regression problem, whatever, whatever it is. Once you know what you're trying to solve, then you can actually figure out what to do and how to solve it. And another, for me, crucial step for any great model is good, great EDA and data processing. So when trying to solve something using data, you have to understand the data to its bones. So you have to know exactly what you're working with, what the data is saying, and more importantly, what structure the data is in. Uh, if you don't understand like the difference between what's one hot encoded, what are some binary variables, stuff like that, if you don't know what the numbers actually mean, 
then it's going to be difficult to actually plug those numbers into a working model. So you have to actually be able to clean and format your data. And once you have all of those things set up and you've done everything in a clean, nice format, then you can actually say that you can run a good model. The modeling part of the whole task is pretty easy nowadays. Uh, Python has all these great libraries, which you can just actually plug and play most of the things and something will come out. Now, that's for a good model. For, so for a successful data product, you need a bit more. Uh, you need to be able to deploy a model, to execute it, to be able to model it, to retrain it. Sometimes you might be able to do some A-B testing if you're doing something big for a, for a huge data set for a big company, trying to implement some new features. Uh, once you see some action from that model, like see some results, you can then redefine your question, do some different things. And at the end, this is what we call the analytics value chain. This is uh, something we defined in my program, uh, in my master's program. So thanks to Chloe and Fasta, my professors for that, I, I lifted this uh, chain off of them. But this is basically what you're trying to do when trying to get value out of data. So I'm going to start with how you can move from a notebook to actually scripting and deployment. Uh, for me, it's following a rule of thumb. When you have a script with something in it, you have to have a different script for each step, which is optional in the overall pipeline. So this is a very small and uh, not too complex example. But for example, in your script, you can have data ingestion and cleaning as a step. That's going to be a different script. Then you have your model training, a totally different script. Your prediction, again, is going to be on a different script. And then when you want, for example, upload your results to some sort of uh, online server, whatever it is, even if, not, if it's not an online server, you can do it locally however you want to do it, that should also be a different step. The idea is that you want to be able to customize your deployment, whatever you're trying to do. So for example, let's say you're trying to run a model, uh, but that model doesn't need to be trained every day or every time you try to run it, since model training is sometimes both lengthy and tedious. Uh, training a model, if it's a complex model with a lot of data, that can take up to a couple of hours sometimes. I'm sure most data, data scientists know that. So you would want to do that once every once in a while. Once you have that model, though, you can save it as some sort of file, uh, save your model itself, and then just run a model prediction on, for example, one row of data for one new user. Once you have that model saved, that's going to take a second, not less than a second, like a couple of milliseconds. Uh, so if you have all of that customizable in different scripts, then it's very, very easy to actually uh, plug and play the different parts based on what your requirements for the app are. Uh, how to set up a project? For me, I always use a cookie cutter project template. This is an example of one of my projects, how I created it. Uh, most data projects follow a structure very similar to this. Uh, the idea is that if you follow a similar structure, using something like this is a good starting point, just because it makes A, code reproducible, and B, it's also re reusable in many cases. So for example, if you're trying to build something else like a data product, you can just reuse code on the fly very easily without having to do too much overhead in creating something new. Also, if you have this structure like this, it's very easy for others to be able to figure out what you're doing when they reach your repository for the first time. Uh, good structure is always better than no structure, obviously. So why do we want to deploy a model? Sometimes not just running it locally, but online. So in many cases, A, running it only locally uh, creates the issue of having it running on a machine, which can shut down in some cases, break stuff like that, which if you're trying to create a data product, which you have end users for, isn't really ideal. So you want to push it to a cloud somewhere. Uh, modern cloud options are very, very reliable. So things like AWS, Google Cloud Services, stuff like that, they're not cheap, but I wouldn't say they're too expensive. If you're trying to build something small, just to test out. Uh, most of these also have like free trial versions, which you can play around with, uh, running something very small doesn't cost too much. It's like a couple of dollars a month. So if you're trying to build a product for yourself, it's nothing. If you're working for a big company, chances are they would already have invested in something like this. So knowing how to use it is super important just because it's going to be part of your tech stack anyway. So being able to, you know, to use it is important. Uh, it's also scalable. So let's say you start off small, but at some point you reach a point where you have more users than you thought you would. It's very easy running somewhere online to just change what your server requirements are. Uh, increased memory, increased CPU, whatever you want. Uh, cloud servers also give you the opportunity to have user roles and permissions. So if you work on a big team, some people are going to be data scientists like you who are going to have to like write, read data from places. 
you might have analysts who you wouldn't want to give write permissions. So just read stuff like that. So that's a huge, huge uh, useful thing for big servers. And within Use UK, we use Google Cloud Services primarily. So use things like BigQuery, use things like Google Cloud Storage, uh, whatever else you can think of running GCP. Uh, we use Dataflow for ingesting all of our real-time data, which is millions and millions of rows and clicks per day, which is super cool to play around with. And yeah. So the next important thing for me for any uh, useful data app is having proper containerization. And I use Docker, most people use Docker, which is why I'm gonna be talking about it mostly. Uh, why is it important? So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Docker, the idea of Docker is it creates a small operating system, usually Ubuntu, uh, Linux based on your machine. So the idea is that it creates a small container with an operating system on your machine itself with pre-specified requirements. So for all the packages you're gonna be using for your project, you can say which versions you want, you can only install those packages, nothing else is gonna be on there, and only those things will live in that app. The great thing about it is that uh, by having that, you can very easily reproduce the same thing on a server somewhere else or on another machine, which I'm sure that many of you have run into the problem of trying to, if you're not using a virtual environment or if you're not just running, if you're running things locally, there are many cases where you might get package uh, dependency issues. So let's say you're trying to run a new model, you install the new package using pip, and all of a sudden, because your pandas version or your numpy version isn't up to, up to date, something else is breaking, it gives you an error and try to run it. Uh, things like that, once you've ironed them out, you can just give the proper package version requirements, and then Docker will take care of all the rest, and you will never have those issues ever again. And it's then very easy to update. So for example, if a packed version is deprecated, you can just change the requirements file and boom, it just works. So that's why Docker is super useful. Uh, there are a few drawbacks. I would say they're very minor though. So one thing I've noticed since I used to work on Windows, now on Mac, uh, but there are a few differences on how Docker containers behave sometimes, especially regarding uh, trying to open a server, uh, like server hosts are sometimes different. Uh, sometimes some things don't work on Windows, which they did on Mac. As a whole, Windows is a bit subpar when it comes to that, unfortunately. And the other big issue is if you're gonna have a lot of containers, Docker does take up a lot of space. I mean, imagine trying to install a virtual machine for each app you're trying to build. That's very easily gonna eat up your space. Uh, like I said, the benefits are primarily that it's very easy to update and it's very easy to transfer your app to other systems. So when someone else wants to play around with it, it's very easy for them to actually just download it and install it immediately and it's very easy to actually uh, update to a server. Uh, another crucial step for me for any, so this isn't crucial anymore. So the things I just said are were part of what you would need to have a working project. The next thing I'm gonna be talking about are just like cherries on top, which help make it better and are very, very useful when you work for a big company. I mean, not just big company, but within a team, just because it helps A, for yourself in trying to build something out and B, it's especially helpful for teammates who are trying to run something which you built before, or if you're gonna hand over a project, things like that. So let's go over logging and testing. Uh, when do you wanna log stuff in your code? Uh, I usually try to log things in common breakpoints. So you would add try, uh, try catch exceptions in many cases with error loggers. Uh, by doing that, whenever something starts breaking, you can easily see where it is. Uh, you can also have different checkpoints. So for example, I initially told you that you would have different scripts. Just having an information logger at the beginning and of each of those scripts is very helpful when trying to see, okay, for example, did this thing actually run? And seeing how long it, it took to run. By knowing those things, it's then very easy if you want to optimize something. You can see, okay, this, this step of my project is taking way too long. I can dive in a bit deeper here and see where I want to, want to fix things. Uh, testing is especially important for data science projects just because there are a ton of things which can go wrong. Unit tests are very common for QAs. Uh, they're literally every single script you have trying to test out to see if the end result from it is behaving the way it's supposed to. So for example, let's say uh, you have the data ingestion script. You wanna make sure that you have the exact number of rows you wanted to have or uh, different columns have the data type you wanted to have, stuff like that, that could be unit test. Uh, when running a model, you wanna make sure that your end output is, for example, only one, one, uh, one float value or whatever you want it to be. 
uh, very basic tests, which just ensure that your model is behaving the way it's supposed to. By having those in place, each time you run it, if the tests don't pass, then you can make sure not to deploy your new version of your app, because if they don't pass, then it will probably break your app. Uh, reproducibility tests are something very different. They are primarily for data science projects. And their idea is because in data science, you have a ton of randomness. Uh, for example, let's say you're trying to divide your test data set into different cross-validation data sets. If you don't add a random seed in that place, then it's going to divide it in a very different way each time, which is rather unfortunate just because if you do that and you don't add random seeds, you would get different results. So I, for one, when I was working before the data analyst, I did try to run models from time to time, very basic ones. And <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but I do remember there were points where I would run a model. It would come out with a perfect, perfect uh, test accuracy. I'd be super proud of it. And then I'll run it again. And because I didn't save my random state initially, the accuracy would fall a bit. It would come up with different numbers. And there would be times when I would just like start repeating running the model until I get the results I initially had, just because I wanted to make sure that I could share the, the results I wanted with the client. Uh, that is definitely not something you're supposed to do, but I was young and naive and still working as a consultant. So <laughs> those were the dark ages. <laughs> uh, cool, so version control. Again, this is something very familiar to most coders. I'm sure this won't be something new to you, but I do want to point out how important this is for not just data products, but all apps in general. Uh, why is it important? So things break. They break all the time, especially in code. Like I'm sure that every single coder spends half his day trying to figure out why something is breaking. Uh, without proper version control, it is impossible to actually keep track of uh, working version of your production environment. So let's say you add some changes, you save those changes, and then something breaks. Version control helps you very easily revert to a working version of it. Also, uh, having version control, just pushing whatever you've been writing to Git. That way you can ensure that, let's say, your computer just breaks. That happens also. Laptops tend to break sometimes. Uh, by having it on Git, you make sure that whatever you've been working on isn't lost forever. So you can very easily just download off of Git again. And it's also super, super useful when working on a team just because it helps you easily share code across team members and work independently. So let's say two different members are working on different parts of a project. Uh, one can push into the model itself. Another is working on a front end for the app. You can just push independently of each other and work independently on the same thing, which is super useful. Uh, documentation. Documentation is essential in my opinion. And it's something which I at least try to do to a maximum. Uh, there are two types of documentation for me for a data science project. One is having an up-to-date readme file. And the other one is just writing inline comments. So when I write anything in code, I tend to sometimes maybe over comment things. But what my aim usually is, is when documenting, I want to be able to go through my script and be able to read it like a book. So I want to know, OK, I'm doing this because of this, and then this follows. And when I read the script, I want to make sure that by the end of it, I understand exactly what's going on. This is super useful for two reasons. A, if I work on 10 different projects and then come back to this one, like next year, something has to change. It is almost certain that you will forget what you did a year ago. And by having that, it takes so much less time to figure out what you actually did. And B, if you have to hand over a project, having that documentation in place is super useful for them as well. Readme files, I usually use them to uh, set up my project structure. Like I showed you in the beginning, having that cookie cutter structure in place uh, in readme files, showing where what is, and also explaining what you would need to do to actually get your project to run for the first time. So which doc commands to run, which make commands to have a make file, uh, where you would need to add some system, uh, system variables for the things to run, stuff like that. OK, cool. Uh, now that you have everything set up, it's important to be, able to, to be able to know how to automate things. So at Muse, we use something called Circle CI. It's great because first of all, it is automatic connects to GitHub. So if you're pushing something to Git and you have a .circle CI folder in your repo, it automatically connects with the Circle CI app. And in doing that, in the Circle CI folder, you have a small YAML file in which you can set up different parameters and different scripts. Essentially, you can automate things like testing. So if you have test steps to your CircleCI YAML file, 
uh, you can make sure that all of those nice unit and reproducibility tests I was talking about are actually working properly. So they can all be steps in our pipeline. If something breaks, then you can see it visually and make sure where it's breaking. Uh, when deploying something, it's super cool using CircleCI just because you can push it direct to GitHub, open CircleCI and see, okay, this is deploying and you can add a script which automatically makes everything run. So that's awesome. And you can also add authentication. So when pushing something, you wanna make sure that if you're pushing to prod, for example, there's a manual check just to make sure that sometimes you forget you're working on a branch and you're trying to push it into dev, but you push it into a prod environment. And if that happens, you wanna make sure that you are 100% sure that you wanna push it there and not into dev. So you can, if you made a mistake, you can just revert and go back and not break the prod environment, which does sometimes happen, unfortunately, but things like this can prevent it from happening. And finally, uh, job scheduling and airflow in the case of UDK is what we use. Sometimes we also use scheduled queries in uh, Google BigQuery, but they're much superior because they're literally only for queries. Airflow can do a ton of different things. Uh, when this is important. So let's say, like in the beginning, you have processes which need to run often and you don't want to manually run them. For example, updating a model or trying to ingest new data for via, via an API call. Uh, cron jobs in your scripts themselves are simple enough to use. Cron jobs are literally just specifying a time and date when something has to run again, but they're a bit limited. Uh, Airflow is very simple to set up. Well, not too simple. It does take a bit of learning. It has a bit of a learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty, pretty simple to use. And it's extremely powerful just because you can add sorts of dependencies. So you want one step to happen for another, which in many cases is extremely useful. You can add status checks. So in the case of new UTK, we have a ton of cases when we're waiting for data to actually come from Google since we pull all sorts of log data uh, from Google Analytics. So if we, for example, specify to run every day at 10 a.m., sometimes Google is delayed. And if we don't have that status check, our pipeline will break just because it doesn't have the right data. And it's also very simple to use because, uh, very cool to use because you can see progress reports. So inside Airflow itself has an nice UI in which you can see the different steps of your pipeline, how they're running and where they're breaking, if anywhere. Cool. So that's basically the tech stack I think is essential for a cool data product. There are a ton of things like uh, all sorts of stuff which you can connect to Python, for example, Flask, uh, using CSS and HTML to actually create a front end. But those are things which I don't want to dive into since those are things that people can learn on their own and they're not too, too difficult to learn. Uh, I was planning on showcasing uh, one app which we built on a hackathon, but unfortunately my work laptop set it to update right before this. I'm on my personal laptop right now and here I don't have access to my work stuff. So I can just go over it. Uh, at Muse UK in the data team, uh, like I said, I'm a data architect. So I mostly work on getting the right data ingested and getting it in the right format for our developers. Uh, for most data scientists, what I would recommend if they're trying to build a data app is like I said, using something like Flask, which is super lightweight. And it's very easy to actually create like small API calls for a data app. Uh, at Muse UK, we have JavaScript developers. So they use React for building front end and Viz tools, uh, which is great because using React, it's templatable. So for stuff like a hackathon, since they're already building something out for another project, uh, the team just pulled up uh, some of that templated code. And it was very, very quick and easy to actually create the front end using something like React. Uh, we ingested the data for the day itself and we built out a uh, an app which idea was to create article recommendations so the data science team worked on building the model themselves the model itself which was a bit simple but super efficient uh, we did architects worked to uh, create the data in the proper format for the front end we created different scheduled queries which would serve the data for the api calls and then the front end team built out the front end itself which can be built out like i said in a day using the tools I specified, which is super cool. Uh, now, I wanted to also talk about a bit what I think makes a great data, data scientist. And a bit of a hint, it's not what I just presented. So while the things I just showed you are super important in my opinion, and these are things which do help you get to the next level, they aren't things which are make or break. Uh, in my day-to-day, -day, I use a mixed tool, mixed bag of these things. So for example, I'm currently working on a project where I'm trying to bring version control to our 
uh, query environment. When I arrived, we were literally just pushing code using Google's UI, which was super inefficient because we had teams which would, for example, we've built out a table somewhere, they would change the code in it. We had no way of figuring out who or when or what is changing code. And downstream somewhere, things would break. So that was not, not great. Uh, knowing version control and knowing things like pipelines, I was able to quickly think of a method in which we could bring version control to this, to this system. And by doing so, we are now working in a much more efficient way with all of, all of our data architecture. Uh, so what I think makes a great data scientist? First of all, in my opinion, is communication. That is the most essential thing, which for me differs a regular coder from a data scientist. Data scientists have to be able to, first of all, talk to stakeholders. So within the company, there are gonna be a ton of people who actually still have no idea of what they wanna do with the data, or even if they do, they might not have communicated the idea in the most efficient way. You as a data scientist have to be able to ask all the right questions, be able to pick their brains. Uh, you have to realize that you're not gonna be a data expert. So there are gonna be people, people who work in a company for tens, tens of years more than you. You want to be able to understand how to talk to them and realize that they know the data better than you and know that you have to ask the right questions from them to figure out what and how to do with the data you have at hand. Not only that, but you also have to be able to communicate your results in a very efficient way. So being able to run a model and create something cool out of it isn't enough in many cases. Uh, you have to know that, you have to know how to actually present your results in a clear and efficient manner to the relevant stakeholders. Once you know those things, it's very, very easy. Not easy, but it's a lot easier to, to actually create some value for the company you're working for. Uh, at this point, I also wanna thank News UK just because they are an excellent, excellent company in that regard. They're super open to communication, uh, even though we at Questers are contractors for them in a way, they still treat us as equals, as uh, full-time employees. And there hasn't been a time where I have voiced my opinion on something where they haven't like taken it into account. And yeah, it's just been super easy to communicate with them. And I think that the fact that I do communicate that much has made me a more important part of the team, a more valuable part of the team, and has made them trust me a lot more with all the things I do, which is why, for example, they let me build out the architecture thing I've been doing for the past couple of months. Uh, curiosity. Of course, this is a banal one. Uh, data science has to be curious, but it is super important. Uh, not just curious about data, but curious about how data science is changing. Uh, you all know that data science is a relatively new thing. It's been here for what, like five, six, seven years has been as, uh, as uh, not important. Uh, it's been as uh, valuable as it is as a profession, uh, but uh, before that, it, the, the, uh, the data science role was here before that, but uh, for the past like 10 years or whatever, uh, things have been changing constantly. Like every single year, there will be something new in terms of, for example, the past few years, uh, NLP has made huge, huge strides in how things have been changing. Uh, all sorts of new different types of models have come out like daily, not daily, but yearly for sure. Uh, so a data scientist has to constantly, constantly keep reading on about different tech stack, about different modeling techniques, and has to be constantly being willing to evolve in terms of what they do and how they work. And again, a banal one, but a love for data is essential for the job. Uh, I, for one, grew up loving data. Uh, I do data things like just for fun in most cases, uh, just pick out random data stuff to make so, some sort of conclusions and yeah, that's essentially want to be a great data scientist. Uh, so at the end of this, I really want to thank, like I said, the team at Use UK for letting me test out and explore. Uh, without them and their uh, trust in me, I wouldn't have been doing the things I've been doing right now. So again, thank you. They're an awesome company to work for. I really want to make sure that people know that. Uh, they are a good combination of big tech because they have a huge tech stack now. They're a huge company, but they're publishers. So you wouldn't really think big tech is publishing, but they're really putting in efforts to move their tech to the next level and they're investing in a lot of different tech stacks. So I do think that it is a very, very cool place to work for right now. And I also wanna let people know that Questers is currently hiring engineers for Music UK, uh, data engineers as well. So uh, feel free to check out any open positions at questers.com slash open positions. And let me know over LinkedIn, you can find me, Christian Nikolov. 
uh, or email, like wherever you want to. I'm easy to find. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or you can contact the team of questions themselves. And yeah, thank you. I think we can open this up for discussion now. Stella, if you're saying anything, I can't really hear you. So I just checked the question section. So here is one uh, question from Vest Drangajov. Have you considered Anaconda uh, versus Docker? What does Docker provide as an extra? So if by Anaconda you mean just virtual environments, uh, yes, they do work. But Docker provides the extra thing of actually having it. First of all, you can just have one small requirements.txt file in which you can very easily change out everything you want instead of having to run everything over and over again in your virtual environment. Uh, for something small, virtual environments work great. I use Vens all the time, uh, but they are a bit harder to work with if you wanna actually have something automated. Anything else? Um, Vess is commenting, Conda tries to address uh, versioning somehow, but point taken. What are the best practices in abstract uh, portability of model algorithm uh, and parameters? Have you worked with any technologies that export or uh, version models across languages, Python, R, Julia, just like data has probable formats? Huh. That is a very great question, which I unfortunately do not feel I am uh, expert enough to actually answer. Uh, hmm. Let me think about it for a second. So, hmm. not sure I quite understand your part about abstract portability of algorithm uh, for parameters. I usually use a YAML file. So I try to find all my parameters outside of the models just because having them uh, outside of my scripts, uh, having them in one file uh, instead of all of them makes it much, much easier to A, make sure that I don't mix up something somewhere and B, easily change out something if I want to change anything. Not sure that answers your question. Uh, it probably doesn't, but yeah. I am, so I also want to make sure that it is well known that I am also relatively new at this. Uh, I have been a data scientist for less than a year. So I am, like I said, constantly growing. I'm trying to, pre to practice what I preach to say. Uh, so yeah. Anything else? Huh. Well, we can talk about it offline if you want. Uh, we can check to see what the best practices are. Can people actually talk or is this only Q&A type? So feel free if you have like, if you're on Zoom and have the opportunity to unmute. I'm not sure what the format is, but if you can, I would love to have a discussion with anyone who wants to. Hey, if you just uh, raise a hand, I think you'll be able to talk live if you wish. Um, hello. Hi, we can hear Hi. you. Yeah, it's it's me. It's like I wrote the first two questions, and um, I just wanted to congratulate you on the great talk. Um, and obviously, those are things that I've been thinking about in the past, but obviously there isn't the right answer for them. 
I had to one more question, which is about uh, you mentioned you upload stuff to big uh, Google BigQuery. Yeah. And my guess is that in a lot of your models, you kind of uh, cache uh, some results. And basically, people can use those uh, in their apps or whatever, you know, they can query those results. Um, yeah. What about situations where you have to actually make your code visible uh, to third party services like a microservice or uh, something like that? Uh, basically, you have to make the either the R or the Python code visible and callable from the outside. Have you worked with that? Uh, I have not, to be honest. So again, great question. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, yeah. Because I, Most I of guess our, yeah. it's, it's it's like an even bigger kind of form, so to speak, because in my experience, for example, I've worked a little bit with R, and the problem there is that it's uh, it's really a research language it's not a yeah 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 so i put r here i put r here in this presentation just because a lot of data scientists i know do work with r but r is just like you said very academic uh even in the program i i went to there was some professors who uh enforced us to work with r i don't understand why but uh so i had a discussion about this with my boss at linkedin uh she was very adamant and also a huge r promoter um she she was adamant on the opinion that each language has a purpose. So while I do think that R is great at just having a ton of different libraries for different models, that's about all it can do. So you probably can. I have never ever created a data app using R. Uh, I assume that instead. So like I said about different scripts you would have in something like this. You would probably just have an R model script in place of the uh, the Python script for your model, and then it could probably work. But I don't think uh, I I would test out something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I think even with Python, basically, if you're building something that, as opposed to something that would render results for yourself or or from your for your team but rather something that plugs into like a bigger software architecture, yeah, uh, it gets more difficult. So I think at some point, as you said, even if you are a great data scientist or, or you know the language in and out, you maybe have to also get into the robust kind of basics of how to write good software as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So very good point. Uh, when I say great data scientists, I don't wanna say that people who don't know those things aren't great data scientists but they're data scientists with the purpose of just doing data science one off in most cases. Uh, if you wanna build apps, products, stuff like that, then you will need to get your hands dirty and learn, learn some of these basics. And like I said, all the things I just mentioned are basics. Uh, there are a ton of different things which I don't even know yet. Things like Terraform, things like, I don't even know, uh, all sorts of like software, software things, uh, which can make your life easier. Uh, people who know JavaScript beforehand, D3 is an amazing thing for data visualization. Uh, if you can get the hang of that, that is amazing for data apps. But yeah, it's it's definitely, if you wanna be great, great at this, then you will have to become uh, a software engineer at some point. And again, thank you for, for that. It was uh, great to hear it and to see the presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the nice words. Well, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can uh, put an end to this uh, evening's uh, awesome. presentation. Thank you, Chris, for the great presentation. Um, and thank you all for joining. Stay tuned for the, our next Tech Talks. Thanks for hosting me and hope everyone learned something. Good night for now. Bye and good night. <laughs>